Now, what a subject lies before us tonight, and I want to read from Matthew chapter 5, first of all, please. Well, maybe we'd better begin just to help you. In Leviticus 19 and 12 as a base text, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 19 and 12. The RAV reads, 19 and 12 of Leviticus, And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. And Matthew 5, please, and verse 33. 5 and 33. Again you have heard that it was said of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, Do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and let your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Pretty straight talking, isn't it? 23 of Matthew, Matthew 23 and 16. And Christ is thundering against the hypocrisy of the interpretation of these laws on swearing and oaths amongst the Pharisees. 23, 16, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold of the temple that that's, or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore he who swears by the altar swears by it, and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it, and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat or a midge and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we not, would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you were the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measures of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore indeed I sent you prophets, wise men and scribes, some of them you kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, 
Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say unto you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, the story is told of a very famous American baseball leader of an American baseball team who was attending a meeting to negotiate a contract for professional football in uh, New York. And suddenly, as he was sitting in this negotiation, he threw down his pencil and he pushed back his chair, and he said, the deal is off. And surprised, the other man couldn't understand this abrupt breakdown of negotiations, for everything seemed to be going well in the deal. And there was big money involved on both sides. And they said, well, why on earth have you called the deal off? What's wrong? And he said, because I don't like the way that you, addressing the man opposite him at the table, have been talking about a friend of mine. And the other football uh, leader said, but I haven't been talking about any friend of yours. In fact, I haven't been talking about anybody. What do you mean? Oh, yes, you have, said this man. You have mentioned my friend in almost every sentence that you have said since you sat down at this table. And the man said, who? He said, you have mentioned the name of my friend, Jesus Christ. Oh, the man said, I get you. He said, I promise I won't do it again. You can count on it. And the deal came on again. All too common in everyday life is this careless introduction into conversations of the name of God or Christ. Our ears tingle. Mine certainly does, and I'm sure Christian yours does as well. Our ears tingle to hear the name that we hold so dear, so flippantly used by thoughtless people every day. People swearing. Now, what is swearing? Well, I've attempted in your notes to give a few definitions to help you. Let me say that I've had tremendous help from a little book called Did I Say That? by Leslie B. Flynn called Did I Say That? Who Controls Your Tongue? Published by Victor Books. Very useful. And he gives a definition of swearing as Swearing involves the irreverent use of God's name as a witness or a party to some statement. Calling on God to be a witness to something you say or a party to something you say. That's swearing. It's often thought to be synonymous with profanity, that swearing and profanity are the same thing. Well, that's not so, actually. Or blasphemy and cursing. They're not identical with swearing. Profanity includes all irreverence of holy things, whereas swearing is one particular type of sacrilege. Now, try and get a hold of that. Profanity includes irreverence of anything holy, but swearing 
is particularly related to one area. Blasphemy is intentionally, with your tongue, offering an indignity to God. That's blasphemy. You are blaspheming when you are offering with your tongue a word that brings indignity offered to God or holy things. Now, for example, Rushdie and his book, The Satanic Verses, has the whole of Europe ablaze at the moment because folk in Islam say that he's guilty of blasphemy against their prophet Muhammad and against God. What does that mean? They, in their terms, would define that as Rushdie offering an indignity with his pen to God. And they say he's guilty of death according to Islamic law. They take it very seriously. They're going to kill him if they can get the slightest chance. And anybody who did kill him would be counted a hero and given an extra welcome in heaven according to what they teach. It's not what the Bible teaches, but that's what they are teaching. And why is it? Will somebody tell me why it is that Islam is on the move That Islam is on the move all over Europe. The day after day, thousands of them are on their knees in prayer. That they would burn books in public that they would even consider to be blasphemous and they wouldn't have them. They wouldn't have anything to do with them and teach their children so. And Christians who believe they have the truth from the living Word of God, are fast asleep in this area, and sometimes it can roll past them, and we don't even raise a whimper. And books can be written against our Lord Jesus, and indignities and blasphemies brought against the person of Christ and our God in almost every paragraph, and there's not a sound of it. What's wrong? I went through Glasgow the other day, and I think it's the largest mosque in any city in all of Britain. You want to see the size of it, plumb in the middle of the city, and it's on the rise. And these people are absolutely dedicated and wouldn't even let their children go to school if they haven't got their heads covered, the girls. And I look at them, and I listen to them, and how unashamed they are. They'd give up education, they'd give up everything to follow what they believe. And we believe we have the truth as it is in Jesus, and we've got used to it, and it doesn't seem to really excite us if people insult it. What a change, what a turn of affairs. Blasphemy is that which offers an indignity to God. Profanity is irreverence of all things that are sacred and holy. Cursing is that which implicates God's name with another's damnation. You want somebody to go to hell, so you tell them to go to hell in God's name. That's cursing. But what is this swearing? What is Jesus talking about when he says, swear not at all? Now, folks, it's difficult, and I've got to face it. That's what a Bible class is about. We don't just take the popular things and the easy things. We've got to face head on the problems. And I believe that as Christians, we, sh- we shouldn't be going around as fanatics. I believe as Christians, we shouldn't be going around with, with, uh, with fanaticism that is not based on love and kindness and compassion, for you never heard Paul condemning anybody to death who opposed him 
or wanting anybody gunned down who opposed him after he became a Christian. Before he became a Christian, he wanted to kill everybody that he thought was blaspheming God's name. But when he became a Christian, never at any time did he implicate that any of his enemies should be killed. In fact, we're told to love our enemies and do good to those that despitefully use us. But oh, that we could have some enthusiasm in the midst of what we are called to do for with love and compassion and wisdom and balance defending this lovely name and standing up for this lovely name and not allowing this lovely name in our presence to be, to be dragged down and cut down and, and made that which is common. Our Father which art in heaven hallowed be your name. It should always be sacred. But what does it mean then when Jesus talks about swearing and swearing not at all? Well, the teaching of Scripture in the area of swearing, which is oath-taking. Oath-taking. That is taking an oath with God's name in it. Swearing, using God's name as saying, by God I will do that. As sure as God exists, I promise to do that. Or whatever. That which is a oath, taking God's name, well, what is Jesus saying about it? It's like the teaching in Scripture on divorce. And the teaching on divorce, right through Scripture, is very similar to the teaching on oaths. God does not prefer oaths. God does not himself like oaths. But God permits oath-taking as he permitted divorce because of man's sinfulness and the hardness of man's heart. Because of human untruthfulness because basically men and women and boys and girls were such awful liars, God allowed oath-taking to become part of the life, lives of people. And of course, the Pharisees, they tried to get around it by saying that false oath-taking meant a profane use of God's name, not a dishonest pledging of one's worth, word. So they set up a whole lot of ridiculous and elaborate rules for the taking of oaths. You heard Jesus talking about it there in Matthew 23. They would say, if you swear by the gold of the temple, then you've got to keep your promise. But if you just swear by the temple itself, you don't have to keep your promise. You can break it. If you swear by the gift on the altar and say, by the gift on the altar, I'll do this, uh, you'll have to keep it. But if you swear just by the altar itself, then you don't have to keep it. And of course, this was ridiculous. They said that formulae which included the divine name made the vow binding. They said that you don't need to be so particular about keeping vows in which the divine name of God has not been used. No, said Christ, however hard you try, you can't avoid some reference to God no matter what you swear by. For the whole world is God's, and you cannot eliminate him from any of it no matter what you use as a formulae in your oath-taking. If you say, by heaven I'll do that, well, it's his heaven. So you're implicating God's name. If you say, if you say well, by earth I'll do it, then it's his footstool, just as heaven is his throne. If you say, well, well by Jerusalem I'll do that then, well, that's his city. If you say nothing about Jerusalem or heaven or the earth, you say, by my head I'll do it, your head was created by God. So God's name is implied. It's under his control, your head. He is saying powerfully that anybody who makes a vow has got to keep it. 
whatever attestation or formulae he uses, if you make a promise, you should keep a promise. So strictly speaking, all formulae are superfluous. A vow, a promise is binding irrespective of whatever accompanying formula you put to it. The real implication of the law is that you've got to be a person of your word. If you say you'll be there at 12 o'clock, then be there at 12 o'clock unless you have a very good reason for not being there. If you say, I will deliver that order, then you will deliver that order if that is what you say. If you have to raise half the country to get it done, you and I should be famous all over the country for keeping our word on whatever we promise. And if you and I were famous for that, vows would be absolutely unnecessary. That's what Jesus is saying. Swear not at all. Your word should be your bond. You don't need to say by heaven or by this or by that or by the other. Just say, I'll be there. Just say, I'll do that. Just say, yes, I'll, I, I'm committed to it. My word is yes or my word is no. Of course, the little word no is powerful. A fellow rang me up the other day about something. He's pushing me on it. And I couldn't say yes to him. So I said no. He came on and he asked me for two things. And I said, well, the answer is no on both counts. He says, well, just leave it there then. And away he went. I've never heard of him since. And he talked for quite a while until I said no. I wasn't trying to be nasty. I was just saying no. You see, no is a very powerful word. You say, yeah, it's too harsh. Yeah, isn't it? So we use all kinds of things to try and fool them that we don't really mean no when we do mean no. And that makes it even worse. If you say yes, say yes. If you say no, say no. And anything more that you have to add to that, well, Jesus says, is really from the evil one. Now let's face a question here, because there are two questions. Why has God himself used oaths in Scripture? Why? Why did God say to Abraham, by myself I have sworn that I will indeed bless you? Why did God swear never to destroy the earth with a flood again? Why did God swear that he was going to send a Redeemer? Or why did God swear that he was going to raise his son from the dead and eventually bless Israel? Why did God use oaths? Well, I can tell you it wasn't to increase his credibility, but it was to confirm our faith. The reason why God says, I will swear by myself because there's none higher was not because of any unworthiness in God. It is because of our unbelief that God says, I swear by myself. He came down to this level of using an oath as we would use an oath so as to confirm our faith, but it's not showing any evil in God. If Christ's statement prohibiting our swearing does that mean that you are not allowed to stand up and swear an affidavit for any purpose before a commissioner of oaths and give evidence on oath in a court of law in Northern Ireland? I swear by Almighty God or whatever. Does this Christ saying you swear not at all imply that you are not allowed to use that kind of phrase. Well, as far as I know, if you have a conscience about that, the British authorities allow you to have another statement where you don't have to swear by Almighty God. They have another statement for those who have a conscience about that area where they will simply promise to tell the truth. But I think this is worth remembering. It's worth remembering that the Lord Jesus did not refuse to reply when the high priest put him on oath. 
because the high priest looked at Christ and he said, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he didn't refuse to come under that oath. He answered him. He confessed that he was. And that later they would see him enthroned at God's right hand. So let me distill it clearly, I trust, and simply for you. What the Lord Jesus is emphasizing in his teaching was that honest people do not need to resort to oaths. It's not that we should refuse to take an oath if required by some external authority to do so. God himself used oaths. But we ourselves should be a people where we don't even have to use them. We don't even have to say, as sure as daylight, I'll do it. You simply say, I'll do it. And that girl knows you'll do it. Or that man knows you'll do it. Or that child knows you'll do it. If my dad says it, he'll keep it. The child should be able to stand in front of their friends and say, my dad said it, he'll deliver. I know him. Or my mom will do it. She said she would do it. If it is all humanly possible, she will keep her word. That's the kind of mom I've got. That's what Jesus is saying. You don't need to use oaths as believers. Your word should be your bond. Pretty powerful teaching, isn't it? So oath-taking is really, in fact, a pathetic confession that we are very dishonest people normally. Oaths arise in human life because people are basically very often liars and you can't trust them. In fact, there was a Jewish sect once that said a person who cannot be believed without swearing by God is already condemned. For if he has to say, by God, I'll do it, that means then that he wouldn't do it. If he has to bring God's name into it. Our unadorned word should be enough. When a monosyllable uh, will, will do, syllable will do, why waste your breath by adding to it? So much for oath-taking, swearing. But now back to our definition, which says that swearing involves the irreverent use of God's name as a witness or a party to some statement or the employment of God's name as a party to improper ends. Well, if you tell deliberate lies in a court of law when you're under an oath, then of course that's swearing in a wrong way. If you say, even if you say to a friend, so help me God, if it isn't true, and then proceed to tell a deliberate lie to that person. The reinforcing of a lie by the use of God's name is false swearing. The dark depths of Peter's denial is understood more clearly when we remember that he said he didn't know Jesus. And how did he say it? With an oath. He brought God's name into trying to prove that he didn't know Jesus. And of course, foolish oaths. Foolish oaths likewise come under the category of false swearing. There was a man called King Saul once who swore on the day of a battle. He swore that anybody eating food before evening would be in trouble and his own son didn't hear his oath and ate something and the people had to save Jonathan from his dad slaying him because of a foolish oath. Centuries later, 40 men promised that they would not eat or drink until they had killed Paul. That was a very rash and evil oath. Undoubtedly, they didn't keep it. And of course, if you're angry, you get mad, and you use God's name in your anger. 
And my friend, what an awful thing it is. Imagine getting mad at someone and saying, God damn. What an awful word that is, God damn. Used in films constantly. Used in literature constantly. It means, in effect, God damn you. And Christian, you can't use it with a good conscience. You got to get it out of your tongue if it's in your tongue. This is asking God to do something unworthy of himself or unthinkingly introducing God's name as a vent for your anger, both of which are irreverent uses. The use of God's name, then, I have listed in another way is false swearing. Of course, it is using God's name as a conversation filler. That's a terrible thing to do. Do you know that many of the words that we use as conversational fillers are actually square words? We hear people exclaim when they are surprised. They say, oh, good God. Or they say, oh, my God. Or they say, oh, Lord. Or they say, oh, Lord. What is it? Well, they denote God's name to an exclamation mark. You mustn't use a sacred name like God's, which is the highest, most sacred name in all of the universe and all of existence, as an exclamation mark when you're surprised. You mustn't bring him down to that. God is not an exclamation mark when you are shocked or surprised. Got to be careful with that. You know, I have even found myself using God's name in my own conversation lightly and caught myself at this at times when maybe you've lost something, you say, oh, God knows where it is. Whereas you don't really mean God knows where it is. You're really saying, well, only God could know because I don't. You're mad. And it's an irreverent use of God's name can slip in. If you really mean, well, Lord, help me to find it. Lord, you do know where it is. And help me to find it, that's a different matter. It's a flippant remark. And of course, many a time, we preface our remarks by, by degrading God's name and sort of things like we say lightly in protest. We say, honest to God, I really mean it. Or we say, honest to God, I, I didn't do it. That's lightly bringing God's name into that kind of situation. You say, hey, Derek, you're being a bit extreme. Well, my, tell you, my friend, I want to say to you that God's attributes often exclaim and explain rather the divine name and thoughtless use of a quality describing God can be considered irreverent. If you call a man, oh, he's just a holy Joe. Well, holy is God's name. And if you are throwing that against someone, it's irreverent. I heard somebody say the other day about another Christian, and I'm sure they really didn't mean it all that, and all the harm, but they were passing on to me what somebody else said, and I began to think about it. They said, um, oh, he's got awful holy recently. Implying sort of holy as he's a pain in the neck. He's going too far. But that is an attribute of God, and you've got to watch how you use it. Holy is God's name. Or you jump around and say, Oh, merciful me. Yes, it can be irreverent uses of the attributes of God. Many, many, many slang expressions that we are using are nothing but substitutions and conversational fillers and variations of powerful swear words. I remember as a lad very well, WTC Rankin taking me aside at Newcastle CSSM as a lad of 11. And he said, Derek, he says, I hear you going about saying, Cor, blimey. 
Well, at the time, Lonnie Donegan had a hit on the hit parade about Koblami trousers that his dad wore, and I thought it was a terrific song. Man, you still like Lonnie Donegan. But I remember that very godly headmaster from Birkenhead saying, do you realize what, what car or co-blimey means? I said, no, sir. He said, it means God blind me. I didn't use it again. Do you know that God's blood in the English language has become by God? Do you know that the expression, um, or, or by God, G-A-D, which you kind of get in Shakespeare a lot, by God, by God this, by God that, meaning God's blood. And the expression by God has become in our language by gum. We don't want to go the whole way, so we break it up. The word cripes, he said cripes, is actually an abbreviation for Christ. And Jeepers Creepers is an abbreviation of Jesus Christ. And for crying out loud is also an abbreviation of by God or for God's sake. And even the phrase damn it comes from God damn it. So we've got to be very careful in the expressions we use even as an exp uh, you know, as a, as a reaction, as a surprise, that we are not actually using words that are abbreviations of the Savior's name. You see, it really is a very, very powerful word when Jesus said, say yes or say no. You say, come on, Derek, have I hit my nail with a hammer? Do you want me to say, well, I'll not do that again. <laughs> I'll lay the hammer aside. Am I not allowed to say anything? Yeah. Well, my friends, you've got to be careful what you say, and I've got to be careful what we say. I want to start a campaign. Uh, a campaign tonight in your life and in my life for restoring to our everyday conversation reverence for the Lord's name. And anybody next or near us who comes near to taking it in vain, we gently remind them and don't stand for it. You say... Well, I've used a whole lot of these words and I didn't mean anything by them. I, I used them innocently. Well, that's just the point, isn't it? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord without meaning something by it. Do you know that it is said of Sir Isaac Newton that he never in conversation, the great mathematician, Cambridge professor, never used the name of God without pausing before he used it. And he was even known to lift his hat when he used the name of God. Oh, that we had reverence like that. That before we even used the Lord's name, we thought carefully about what context we were using it. Why do people swear? Why when you go into the factory, into the university, into the college, into the school, everywhere around you, people in every sentence are saying, by Jesus this and Jesus that and for Christ's sake this and for God's sake the other. I listened to a fellow on Terry Wogan last night and he brought God into every paragraph he was at. I was nearly down the tube after him. When I went before Her Majesty the Queen this year, did I say, oh, by Queen Elizabeth this and by Queen Elizabeth that and by Queen Elizabeth I'll do the other? I kept my mouth shut. Would you go and talk about your mother and say, oh, my mother, by my mother this and by my mother that and God damn you, by my mother? No, you wouldn't. Why? 
because you love your mother or you respect the sovereign. And I want to tell you that the lovely Lord Jesus loves you more than even the most adoring mother will ever love you. His love for you is so vast and his love for you is so great that it could not be calculated in any formula or any statement. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. Reaches to the highest star, reaches to the lowest hell. That love is poured out for you. And my friend, why then do you allow or use lightly his name? You wouldn't do it for your mother or some dignitary in the nation that you respect. Well, why do it with God then? What on earth has gone wrong with us? Well, why do so many people swear? Well, it seems to me they want to give vent to their feelings. And a few times when they get mad or something or are hurt, they use a swear word and it becomes easy and it vents their feelings. There are some psychiatrists and psychologists will tell you it's good for you to swear. Get it off your chest. And then they indulge in a few swear words to vent their feeling and it gets it out of the way and then it becomes a luxury. And before you know where you are, you're unruffled and undisturbed and you use it all the time. But it's very foolish. Why is it foolish? Because it is pointless. It doesn't honor God. And I tell you, if you lightly use God's name in false swearing, then, my friend, it doesn't bring any honor to you. I want to tell you, those of you watching and listening, wherever you are, it indicates clearly what's going on in your mind. As I listen to many young people and older people and they're swearing and swearing and swearing and swearing with everything they do. They can't even fill up a petrol. They can't even buy a Mars bar without swearing. Almost. It shows you what's going on. I think what's going on in their minds. And what does it do to little children all around us? It pollutes their minds with these words. It shows our lack of self-control. And I tell you, it'll not be easy for you to go right through life and not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That is without a point. Without a meaning by it. Sometimes evangelicals can become so, so used to using this lovely name that they use it in all kinds of things that they shouldn't be using it in. I wonder do people who take the name of Christ in vain have any idea how they are hurting true devoted believers? The two top swear words in Great Britain at the moment are God and Christ. Why do they have to use our lovely Lord's name? They don't say, oh, by Mick Jagger I'll do it, or by Whitney Houston I'll do it, or Shawadi Wadi I'll do it. Well, they were years ago, sorry. They don't, they don't say by this, that, or the other. You don't hear them saying, by, by, by Bob Geldorf, I'll do it. Tell me, why do they lose our, use our lovely Lord's name and God's name? Why speak flippantly of Christ? A traveling salesman was once asked, Tell me, sir, said the lady to him, are you paid for swearing? He said, no, I'm not. Well, she said, well, you're certainly worked very cheap because you've laid aside your character as a gentleman and you inflict pain on your friends and you break a commandment and you're going to lose your soul all for nothing. Need a few ladies like that around. What about the poison of swearing? Well, it's well explained in that little story I told you on the back of your note sheet about the nobleman visiting the Wedgwood factory, famous for pottery, shown around by a lad, and I tell it for those watching by audio and video, shown around by a lad of 15, and Mr. Wedgwood followed a few steps behind. And during the tour, the English peer, who was a recklessly irreverent man, uh, though a brilliant conversationalist, shocked and captivated the lad who began to laugh heartily at his profanity. 
And when the tour was over, Mr. Wedgwood sat in his office with a nobleman holding up a beautiful vase before the peer who was about to receive it, and Mr. Wedgwood deliberately dropped it on the floor, shattering it in countless pieces. Angrily, the peer demanded, why did you do that? There are other things more precious than this piece of pottery, said Mr. Wedgwood. I can, sir, make another vase as beautiful as this, but you cannot give back that boy his former simple faith and reverence which you have destroyed by your irreverent talk. I was walking past a shop in an Ulster town the other day, owned by a certain man that I knew. Thirty, thirty-five years ago, easy, when I was but a nipper, you'll have to know, and I was walking by his shop and I remembered a smutty remark he made in our house at home in Newcastle. And I thought it was awful funny, but it was filthy. And the Lord is my judge as I stood looking in that shop window, not owned by him now. I could still remember it. And I shivered on the street almost. Watch what you say, sir, madam. There are little minds listening and watching. And I'll tell you why it's so serious. The person who habitually speaks lightly of God's name doesn't easily run to the one whose name he treats lightly. The name of the Lord, says the Bible, is a strong tower, and the righteous runneth into it and are safe. And if you're cursing and swearing all day and using God's name lightly, then the swearer finds it very embarrassing to come and say, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Very difficult to implore God have mercy on me if he's been swearing all day long. You say, ah, oh, it's just a bad habit. My friend, it's more than that. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who taketh his name in vain, who takes his name meaning nothing by it. How to overcome it? Well, swearing is so serious that I want to make a statement about it. If there was only one sin in the world and that sin was swearing, false swearing, and it had been committed just once, Jesus Christ would still have had to die to pay for it. That's how serious it is. I had a friend who played in the Portadown Golf Club. He was a huge man. And every year, the Portadown Golf Club at Carrick Blacker gave the man who swore the most in the golf club a swear box. The guy who used it most got the swear box as a presentation. I don't know whether it was to get him stopped or to embarrass him or whatever. Don't know whether they still do it. But he had this unenviable uh, trophy. One day he was standing by a graveside burying his uncle, who was a man of God. And the undertakers were in a hurry. Undertakers are always in a hurry. And he was in a hurry. And I know we preachers are famous for preaching too long at funerals, but this day I felt an urge. And just standing by the grave, service was just over. I started up the hymn, When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Boy, did they sing, because this man with bearing was a great singer and a very happy Christian, famous for his singing. In fact, he used to sit and listen to me, and when I was doing well, he used to suck in. He used to go, and when I wasn't doing so good, he blew out. When he was going, I knew I was getting on well. He was a great character. 
please suck in. But there he was. Wonderful, happy Christian, real character. You can hear him in a meeting, either enjoying it or whatever. I thought we can't bury old Bob and not sing like he used to sing. So we sang this hymn. This fellow with a swear box is looking into the grave, and this is his uncle, and he told me later, he says, boy, he says, that got into me. I knew if the rule was called up yonder, I wouldn't be there. And I'd never see him again in heaven. And he says, Derek, he says, it haunted me. He says, I played golf. I went to the pub. I, I drowned bucket fools almost of beer to try and drown my sorrows. And it came after me like the hound of heaven. When the rule is called up yonder, I'll be there. And he says, one night I could take it no longer. He says, he says, you know, or one day in the middle of Porter Down Car Park, I looked up into the sky and I said, oh God, give me a break. I'm only 35. He thought if he became a Christian, it would all be a wreck and a ruin, you know. He didn't understand the love of God that if he became a Christian, he'd never know joy like it. Imagine saying that to the Lord. Give me a break, Lord. I'm only 35. And God's saying, I want to save you, son. Some fellows have strange notions of God. And one night he told me about three in the morning, he got out of bed, dropped by his bed, and received Christ as his Savior. He said, I surrendered to the Savior. And he says, do you know, Derek? He says, something happened to me. He says, all that swearing dried up. And he says, he went out and spoke to the wife and he spoke to my friends and there wasn't a swear. I couldn't understand it. He said, I could never speak without swearing. It stopped. Used to be a very famous garage in Newcastle called Macaki's Garage. And I remember so well Victor McManus having a mission in the cinema when I was a little boy and the man who owned that garage, Mr. McCaffey, the most famous man in our town for swearing, falsely. He got saved. And he was the eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> that town, what has happened to Bob McCaffey? He's not swearing anymore. What a great Christian he became. What a testimony in the town. And he used to swear away at the people, you know, as he was taking their money at the petrol station. And they couldn't, what's wrong with Bob? He's flying on a plane between Chicago and, uh, between San Francisco and Chicago one day. And I've told this story before and I'll tell it again. Girl sitting beside me didn't want to talk to me, could you blame her? <laughs> and I'm talking away and let's not go into it all now, but you know, and she just wouldn't talk to me. And then after a while, she turned around and she said, Sir, what's your job? And I said, Lord, if she won't talk to me whenever she doesn't know what I am, if I tell her I'm a preacher, she'll really not want to talk to me. So I drew breath and I said, I preach the gospel around the world and teach the word of God. And she said to me, Sir, she said, when you preach, she said, I'm a Roman Catholic. I said, I'm glad to meet you. Very quickly. I'm very glad to meet you. She was glad to meet an Ulsterman who wanted to shake her hand. I said, I'm glad to meet you. She said, sir, when you go preaching, do you tell them that they need to be born again? I nearly fell 35,000 feet. <laughs> if I could have got out. I said, why are you interested? She said, yes, there was a fellow in our class, the dirtiest tongued, filthiest minded fellow in our school, couldn't speak without swearing, falsely, of course, and badly, terrible. And she said, one day, the mind like a sewer pipe, the girls couldn't stand him. He came into school, and he never said a filthy thing. I couldn't understand what had happened. What had gone wrong in his life, or right in his life, to get him away from this wrong? I watched him for three days. I listened to him for three days, and I went up, and I said, what on earth has happened to you? You're totally transformed in your language. He said, yes. He says, I am. I have been uh, born again. He said, sir, is that what you preach? Can you imagine the chat we had all the way to Chicago, folks? I tell you, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. It was great. Christ can do this. You need the new birth friend if you want to stop your swearing. You need Christ in your life. And then when he comes in, then you have got to be very careful to examine those verbal ejaculations when you are surprised, because they can creep into a person who's born again too. Prince Charles has been giving off recently about bad grammar in his staff. Well, I used to be an English teacher, and boy, marking essays was, was a laborious business with grammar, gra mistakes in grammar, deadly. Duns for dids and dids for duns, and 
You know, there's a fellow here tonight, I think he's here tonight, and when I was at primary school, his mother taught me the difference between which and a witch. Shows you how old I am. When I look at him, it scares me. He's very tall. Wonderful. The mistakes we make in grammar, and we want to get rid of them and write good letters and speak well, and we take, we take great care when we're going for a job interview to speak properly and to get our grammar right. Well, go after our reverence with the same zeal. Knock it out of your life. Transformation of my sacrilegious speech patterns is part of ongoing sanctification. And as the Lord brings words before you that you're using lightly by the power of His Spirit, then get rid of them. It'll have a powerful cleaning effect in your office and your home, wherever you are. And then control your anger. I heard about a cre preacher one day who was going along and, 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 and he had an accident. He didn't mean to have one. We have a man here, you know, who fixes cars that are wrecked. And uh, I took my car up to his place and a big sign meets you up there, up the shankle. It says, sorry, we had to meet by accident. <laughs> Mr. Davies' famous firm, it's called, You Bend It, We Mend It. What a lovely little phrase. And I'm not on commission to Mr. Davy, but he does a good job. And if you want your car fixed, I'm sure he'll fix it for you. But, you know, sorry we had to meet by accident. This guy had an accident, and he really was sorry about it. But the guy jumped out of the lorry that he put into the ditch, and he came running to him, and he cursed at him. And he swore at him falsely up and down. And the preacher could feel his anger rising. And he said, sir, he said, I am a preacher and I am not allowed to swear, but I hope when you get back home, your mother-in-law runs out and bites you. <laughs> and that's a true story. <laughs> now, had he overcome his tongue? No, he hadn't. Even saying that was wrong, was it not? The preacher's reply was not complete victory over his speech. Cultivate in your life a sense of reverence. And if you're in the presence of the Lord, you immediate presence, you wouldn't do it. Well, you are all the time. Now time is away. And I don't want to keep you long because it's cold and some of you got to go far. But five minutes on lying. What is a lie? Well, a lie is saying that which is not true with the intention of deceiving somebody. A mistake in a statement is not a lie. For example, if a radio announcer says 19 people were killed in the accident and only 18 were, well, that's erroneous information, but he's not lying with intention to deceive. If your action is contrary to your previous statement, it's not lying whenever unforeseen circumstances lead you to alter your previous intent. Let me add that to your notes. Action following contrary to your previous statement because of unforeseen circumstances altering your previous intent. Peter said to Christ, you will never wash my feet a few words from the Lord, and he says, oh, he says, Lord, he says, would you wash my hands and my head as well? At the start, he wouldn't even let him wash his feet. He changed his mind with good intent. To conceal or withhold part of the truth when it isn't expedient or necessary to tell it is not a lie. You remember Samuel was told by God to go and anoint David, and he said to God, if I go down there, Saul will kill me. So God said to him, well, go and tell him, take a heifer with you, and you're telling, tell him you're coming to make a sacrifice to me. He didn't tell him the whole truth, for he'd have got killed if he had. So he withheld part of the truth. That wasn't a lie. That was expedient. Saul had no right to know the entire purpose of Samuel's mission. You don't need to draw the full circle, you know. Concealment is not lying. 
Life would be intolerable if we had to disclose everything we know. If I disclosed everything I know in my ministry, I'd blow everywhere I am apart because people share with me very intimate, difficult problems in their lives and their sins and their trials and their difficulties. And if I told it on them, you'd wreck the place. A tale-bearer reveals secrets, says the Proverbs, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. If you're faithful to your friend, you won't bring out all that dirty linen and say, oh, well, I have to tell the truth. <sighs> Difficult one with Rahab, is it? isn't it? Have you got any spies here, Rahab? No. Did you see them? I, they went that away. And she's a woman of faith. And God commends her for hiding the spies. Is it right to tell a wee white lie? Well, I've thought a lot about this. Hers was an extraordinary case, wasn't it? But it doesn't create a precedent. I think a lie is still a lie. I cannot see the Scriptures allowing for a lie to be justifiable. Can you? What she did was well intended, and God recognized that it was well intended, but there was a mixture of frailty and folly in what she did. You say, if somebody was going to kill someone you were hiding, would you tell them where they were? That is called the tragic moral choice. And that is not easy to answer. But I have to honestly say before God that the Bible never justifies a lie. There are a whole lot of wee ways of lying, you know, that turn into big lies. There's a direct lie. Uh, who are you, says uh, the old man? I, me, saw your firstborn was a lie. There's professional lying. You stay off work for a day or two. You haven't been in hospital, but you want them to think you have. So you get somebody to ring up and say, uh, Jimmy left his glasses up here at the hospital. Could he come for them? And he never was at the hospital, and he doesn't have glasses. <laughs> That's not giving you any ideas. <laughs> professional lying. There's perjury, which is a false statement in a court of law when you're under oath. There's social lying. Oh, I'm sorry, I have another meeting. You know that fabricated previous engagement. There's half-truths. Who is this? She's my sister. Well, actually, she was his wife. And it is true that she was his half-sister. It was only a half-truth. But look at what happened. He got thrown out of the nation and a plague came because of him. Abraham, trying to save his wife by telling a half-truth. There's double meanings. Like a man coming home from fishing with no fish, goes to the fish market. Says, throw in a dozen mackerel there. And I've got to say I caught them and I can't lie about it. There's mental reservation. Very famous, isn't it, in Ulster and anywhere. A knock or a phone. If it's for me, I'm not in. I was talking to a person that was trying to remember it the other day, somebody who goes around collecting money, and he went to this house in Belfast, and a wee boy came out. He says, are you looking for the rent, sir? And he said, yes, I am. Well, if you are, there's no hope here, because my mother says if it's the one looking for the rent, she's not in. <laughs> I think it was rent he was lifting. And of course, there's coding out of context, isn't there? Very famous English archbishop went to New York and he got off the boat. And, and when he got off the boat, all the press got round him and said to him, are you going to a nightclub when you are in New York? And very sardonically, he said, are there any nightclubs in New York? Big headline, New York Times next day. Archbishop says, are there any nightclubs in New York? <laughs> you watch what you say because the press can turn it. I know, because I write for them. They can take a situation and they won't lie about it, but they can uh, make it look awful interesting. You watch the headlines on a paper. Yeah. 
I wrote an article once for a Belfast newspaper about a song that Whitney Houston wrote called Where Do Broken Hearts Go? And the editor put a picture of Whitney in and underneath it it said, Whitney Houston Inquiry. Yeah? And you say, what's Whitney done? Well, she wrote a song asking, where do broken hearts go? Yeah, nothing wrong with that. But you've got to watch the press, because they're brilliant at it. So be careful what you say. They don't twist it, but they can, they can blow it up. There's self-detraction, isn't there? You know, the mock humility. Oh, I'm a poor student, and he gets A's and B's. And all he wants you to say is, Ach, you're terrific, son! Mock humility. There's flattery. The things you would say, you would say, you know, to a person's face that you'd never say behind their back. There's exaggeration. There are some people who are so addicted to exaggeration, they can't tell the truth without lying. There's pragmatic lies. I heard about someone who heard a message on archaeology and the Bible, and he met a skeptic afterwards, and he said, I wasn't impressed with that at all. And then he met a believer and said, I nearly got converted through that this morning. People are good at that. Double-tongued, telling one person one thing and somebody else another. Keep two tongues out of your mouth. And I'm sorry, but I've been guilty of it just like you double-tongued. Say one thing there and another thing there with just a slightly different nuance. I was criticizing somebody last week pretty hard. A famous person. And before the day was out, I met him head on. And I nearly dropped. And it wasn't who you think it is. He was tall and big. And he stood there in front of me, and I couldn't believe I was shaking his hand. And I had criticized him. And now I was looking into his face. Did I say the same thing as I said? No. Because I can be hypocritical too. You are the car salesman. And the fellow picked out the car. And the car salesman knew it was a bad car. And the fellow said, will you drive it home? And the car salesman drove it home and said, terrific car, this. Wonderful car, marvelous car. And he knew it was half wrecked. Got into the fellow's house and he's getting his checkbook out, true story. And the man just before he signed it said, would you buy this car? And there was a sign up above him which said, God hears every word you say. And he looked at the sign. Would you buy this car? He said, no. Sale was off. Didn't get his commission. Advertising. I hear there was a hair conditioner, not that I know much about them, but <laughs> there was a hair conditioner re recently that was nationally advertised as saying, this will make your hair feel stronger. And a dermatologist said, absolute nonsense. No such a thing as making your hair feel stronger. There's such a thing even as lying to God. Why have you lied against the Holy Ghost? Was well, said to Ananias. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie against the Holy Ghost? You can lie to God, you know, straight. Unkept vows, you know, to God are lies. Hannah kept her vow. I'll give my wee boy to you, and she did. If you made a promise to God and you haven't kept it, it's a lie. It's a lie if you haven't kept it. Oh, the mischief of lying. Is there a liar in here tonight? The mischief of it? I'd like a chicken. He went into where the ice was in this barrel. He pulls out a chicken, put it down. It weighed five pounds. The lady said, I want the bigger one. There wasn't another one, so we put it back in and pulled the same one out, set it down and said, seven pounds. She said, I'll have them both.
take both of them. I know of a girl who took 10 days off work and said she had the flu and she hadn't. She went back to work and caught the flu and she had to work for 10 days with the flu half erect to cover up her story. Silly woman. It affects you if you lie. It affects others. If an airline doesn't keep its promises, if a TV guide doesn't keep its promises on a schedule, if a newspaper doesn't keep its promises, or whatever, or a magazine, if it doesn't keep its schedule, then of course the whole of society would lose confidence. Business is built upon confidence and the keeping of confidences. The very fabric of society operates on a supposed foundation of truth, and it affects others if you start lying. Oh, can you imagine how little children feel if you, somebody comes to your house and you turn to your wife and say, oh, there's that old windbag coming again. And then you open the door and you take a, oh, hello. We were just waiting for you to come and see us. We were just looking. It's hypocrisy. And then you wonder why your children say the same thing and are double-tongued. Lying affects others. And finally, and you've been very patient, it affects your relationship with God, sir, madam, young person. Lying is contradictory to the nature of God because God is truth and Satan is the father of lies. Lying unless it is forgiven will keep you out of heaven. Anything that defileth, neither whatever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. You need those lies forgiven. And if you repent of your sin and take Jesus as your Savior tonight, he'll forgive you your lying and put the Holy Ghost within you to help you overcome your lying. And then the Holy Spirit will enable you to keep the New Testament command which says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Something to think about, something to act on. Let's have clean tongues and our word be our bond. May God search us. Let's sing.